By March of 1880, just four years after the centennial demonstration, the newly organized American Bell Telephone Company was in control of 60,000 American telephones. They were connected in every city with a population over 10,000. Improvements in switchboard technology allowed operators to handle not tens of calls, but hundreds. The first operators were boys, who earned a reputation for being rude and abusive. The necessity of running from one board to another made for chaos in the telephone exchanges. I usually say, you tell me what it was like when you were a boy, and you get 12 of them together, what's going to happen? It happened. Pure bedlam. We had wrestling matches, bean shooters, spit wads, rubber bands, running, yelling, <gasps> I'm afraid, even some cussing. You have to understand that the equipment now is really, really in its primitive state. There's all kinds of crackling, a lot of noise in the telephone um, system at this time. So for two people to actually conduct a conversation, you needed an operator to transmit in a friendly way and make it less worrisome to the subscriber, less annoying. And the young boy operators were not temperamentally suited for this. The young men were soon replaced by young women who did not swear or trade insults with frustrated customers and were said to be faster than the men they replaced. American women, until then largely consigned to the schoolhouse and home, took over the day-to-day -day management of the switchboards. Certainly there's nothing about the telephone as a technology that says a woman must work at the switchboard and does a better job than a man. But in the 19th century, women were expected to be more docile, more amenable to rules. Men or boys, uh, if they were put under these extreme rules that, that women had to work under as operators and didn't like it, they could vote with their feet and leave and go find another job that paid as well or better. Whereas women having fewer options were more constrained, more likely to stay in that job and take it and work for less. These women worked 12-hour shifts, processing hundreds of calls each hour, working the board with both hands at once. They were expected to follow a strict code of dress and behavior. The company actually kept a deportment card to record transgressions. Very, very strict at the board. No talking, no, don't dare look around. If you moved your head, you'd have five supervisors at your position. Somebody come along and say, what do you want? A high-class service in an operating room is the fruit of good discipline. The selection of girls for operators is the first important step. Great care should be taken to know positively that they are of good character. The training of the voice to become soft, low, melodious, and to carry well is the most difficult lesson an operator has to learn. Operators are to be trained daily on certain phrases and are allowed to use no others in their dealings with subscribers. You could only use certain phrases number please and thank you the customer could say anything they wanted to you and you would say thank you you're a stinker thank you <laughs> you'd like to you said something to yourself but you would uh, that's the time they'd be observing on your line the operator was not allowed to cross her legs she was forbidden to blow her nose or wipe her brow without permission those who married were often discharged. Nevertheless, by 1910, New York Telephone alone had over 6,000 women working at switchboards. It is said that if it hadn't been for some of the technological breakthroughs that simplified switchboard operation, the demand for operators would have gone up so rapidly that by the middle of the 20th century, virtually every young woman in the United States would have to be employed as a telephone operator in order to run the system.